Good evening, afternoon, afternoon, early evening. We're not quite sure where we are, yay. Um, and uh, welcome to our talk today, the no longer silent counter-revolution. There's a lot to be said about this uh, kind of, uh, this, this title that actually asks a lot of questions in itself. So um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on our guest, uh, and Anton Shekotsov. He is a visiting fellow at the IWM, and he's author of the book Russia and the Western Far Right, which you can already order. Um, it is, he hasn't held it in his hand himself yet because it's fresh off the presses, so you will be one of the first readers as well if you order it. So take a look for it. It's called Russia and the Western Far Right. Basically, today we're going to look at the anti-liberal trend of the recent few years, which I'm sure none of us uh, will deny. We've seen the rise of Viktor Orban, the Brexit referendum, the election of Donald Trump, and also more, more locally, um, the strong performances of Norbert Hofer next to the simultaneous strong performance of Marine Le Pen in France gave people a uh, certain um, awareness of this extremist movement. And uh, so today we're looking at this trend uh, in the sense that it's not arisen out of nowhere. It's not a trend that has just appeared. We've seen this actually over the past decades, ever since the Second World War, coming out of a new post-material cosmopolitan attitude that developed after the Second World War. And this has been the counter-revolution to that silent revolution. So he says that the catch-all parties and vague philosophies of the past few decades have left an ideological vacuum, an empty space in which these far, far right, right wing extremists have seen their opportunity to take hold of populist hearts and minds. So Anton, <laughs> my first question to you, it's wonderful to have you here and um, to talk about this. How does this postmodernist counter-revolution of the far right, how did this evolve? Can you paint us a picture of where this came from? Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. And I will also, um, answering this question, I will unpack the, the title of, of, of our discussion, The Silent Counter-Revolution. So probably maybe of you know that in 1977, Ronald Inglehart published a work where he argued that um, there, was, there was a post-materialist revolution in the West going on that people in the West, uh, in, 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 the Western, in, in Western Europe and the US and Canada, people essentially realized uh, or the imp they had their material needs met. And then they were interested mostly in, in developing, in self-realization, in um, establishing new networks and uh, building uh, new designs, you know, this is post-materialist uh, view. And it also changed politics as such, and especially the revolution of, the, the cultural revolution of 1968 contributed to this. But, so this, this cultural revolution, post-materialist revolution, was in force until probably the 1980s. And uh, the political, Italian political scientist, uh, Pierre Ignazzi, he argued that this, uh, this revolution of post-materialist was followed by a silent counter-revolution of the right. And new far-right parties appeared, the old parties reinvented themselves during the 1980s. At that time, they were not uh, really successful. Uh, they started to be successful only in the 1990s and especially 2000s. But because they were in the opposition, they, they would still be described as a sound counter-revolution to that post-materialist revolution. But what we are witnessing now is that the silent counter-revolution to post-materialism and post-modernism is no longer silent. Uh, last year, uh, I, I, would, I, I like to refer to, to the last year as Krampusjahr, sort of uh, the, the German, like the, the terrible year when we had Brexit, when we had Donald Trump elected in the US. So that was, and if we're going, if we're going past 2016, we see the, the counter-revolution of Viktor Orban in Hungary, something that was discussed in the previous panel. So this is no longer silent counter-revolution. These people are now in power. 
So moving from a counter-revolutionary status or a more fringe group of, of uh, people who are, who are uh, leading an extremist movement to the mainstream, this is what makes these movements dangerous. Um, so what are some examples in history where we can recognize a movement like this growing where you can really define when did this shift from a silent revolution or a silent counter-revolution to a mainstream movement? Well, there are two processes going on now, and they started, I think, in the 90s. One process is the mainstreamization of the far right and the radicalization of mainstream. These are two consequent processes. So on the one hand, you have um, parties like the National Front in France, uh, parties like even Freedom Party, uh, Freedom Party of Austria here, or the Hungarian Jobbik Party. These parties, they try to moderate. Uh, they are trying to look more respectable. Uh, but at the same time, they release a space further to the right, uh, you know, on the right from the center right. And this creates another vacuum where some center or formerly center right parties can go and can, can mobilize the voters that were left out by the, uh, these moderating radical uh, activists and radical politicians. So these are two processes and they go, uh, they follow each other. So in, uh, in your paper by the same name, no longer the silent counter-revolution, you say, you speak about the new right and the old right. I mean, I'm, uh, I, I always think to myself in, in these kind of discussions, you know, conservatives are supposed to be boring, right? <laughs> Aren't conservatives supposed to be the ones telling us that there needs to be rules and there need to be uh, enforcements? What, what, uh, what has changed between the old right and the new right? Yes, so in this context, I refer to the, uh, to the old right as these uh, radical right-wing populist parties. Um, I would say that they, they still have a huge problem in, in, in European uh, political societies because they are not e entirely legitimate. Uh, some of them, actually most of them, they are they have developed from quite radical, even fascist movements. So they have this problem with the legitimacy because investigative journalists could, also, uh, could always point to their, to their background, to their historical background, and say, well, addressing to the society, well, well you're not really going to, to vote for these right-wing extremists or neo-Nazis. So they have this problem with the legitimacy. But the center-right, uh, it doesn't have this problem with the legitimacy. If we take, for example, as an example, the development of the alternative for Germany, uh, that, that, was, uh, that was essentially a split from the CDU, from the Christian Democratic Party. And for a very long time, that, was, that party was considered part of, sort of, part of the mainstream, or at least the fringes of the mainstream, but still legitimate. They were, in, the, in the first years of their development, they were not even um, Eurosceptic, uh, radical right-wing. They were softly Eurosceptic. They rejected the Euro, but still, they were a legitimate part of, of the political, political space. So then they radicalized. And now it is very interesting, because Germany, if you look at the electoral history of Germany, uh, they never had uh, such a strong support for a far-right party since the end of the Second World War because of the history of the Second World War, obviously. But now you have Alternative for Germany, which is scoring around 10-11%, and it, maybe it will become the third strongest party in, in, in Bundestag. It has this legitimacy, and it plays with this legitimacy, and it, now it can present itself as a... Um, even moderate opposition uh, to, to Angela Merkel. Moderate, I mean, in, in terms of political culture. Yeah, so that, that, is the, uh, that is still the old right. But with the new right... Uh, with Can you explain that a little more? Sorry, when you said the, the, uh, as, as a more, more moderate, moderate version of I mean, if you, look at, if you look at the far right in Germany historic, historically, uh, or at least in the uh, Cold War in West Germany. So you would have parties like this neo-Nazi National Democratic Party of Germany, or we'd ha you would have a Volksunion, you know, the, the People's Union. These are very extreme parties, 
and they had problem with their legitimacy. Mm -hmm. The IFD does not have this problem because they developed from the uh, this conservative, even liberal conservative part. Then they radicalized, but still, for the people, they are considered as legitimate player. So the fact that they broke away from the city who gives them legitimacy. Exactly, exactly. See, okay. But this is still, I would say, the, this, this old right approach. By the new right, I mean people like um, Prime Minister of Slovakia, Robert Fico, mm -hmm. or Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, or Jaroslav Kaczynski in Poland, or even Donald Trump in the US or the people who essentially orchestrated the, the, the Brexit. So the, this is the center-right, but radicalized center-right. And they are, no, they are not in the opposition. They are ruling their countries, and they, they are essentially these uh, counter-revolutionaries which are no longer silent. So if we look at the, these proponents of the new right, it seems like these are... Um these are personalities rather than political parties or, or political movements. These are, these are people who personify a movement, if, I, if, I've, if I've understood Yeah, correctly. absolutely correct. But I, I would also put this into a larger perspective. If you, um, I think uh, Dr. Fischer said that yesterday, that now we have, or oh, it was mentioned in the discussion, that now we have rather movements that are represented by one person. Uh, for example, Macron. Where is his party? He has no party, yeah? but he has Macron as a label. Um, and in, in, in many other instances, not necessarily uh, radical movements, but we have this personification. And I think exactly because of the transformation of the party political space, and partly because of the catch-all parties that started to develop already in the, at the end of the 1960s, and by catch-all parties in political science, we mean that parties, they are no longer ideological, they appeal not to particular classes, not to particular social groups, uh, but they appeal to the society in general. And when you have several of these parties, they are ideologically not different from each other. Mm -hmm. So again, this leaves this, this ideological vacuum, and then people with strong personalities and strong charismas can fill up the void. And they can be, uh, they can be either liberal or they can be illiberal. But there is this trend that now it's more of a personification of, of politics that is going on. So, um, and again, sorry, just to, yeah. to add something. This is why when we are talking about Poland, we rather talk about Kaczynski rather than Beata Szydło. You know, we're talking about not his party. Well, we're talking about the, the law, uh, law and um, justice, but still we, we talk, we talk about Poland as Kaczynski's Poland, mm -hmm. although he doesn't have, officially he doesn't have any, any post in, in, in the government. Mm -hmm. and, and that is exactly, I mean, the, this, this exact um, uh, idiosyncrasy, I guess, about the, the new right, as you call it, um, of it being person-based or pers persona-based, um, does that, do you think, in your opinion, does that make the movement um, more vulnerable, or does it make it actually more sustainable um, on, a, on the level of um, perhaps a person acting more as a dictator than a leader in that sense? Or is it therefore you know, easier to topple because it's just the one person? I think strong personalities do make these movements stronger, but at the same time, as you, as you correctly said, that it makes them all also vulnerable because it depends on only one, one person. But then it's also um, a question of how long <laughs> these people can live. Uh, in the case of the Czech Republic, for example, where this liberal turn is, is represented by Miloš Zeman, well, he's quite an old person. And whether there would be a, a, someone else who would lead the same, the same illiberal movement, that is still a question. Um, I would also say that uh, sometimes it, it, they are more vulnerable because they may be discredited. And by discrediting those people uh, who lead the illiberal turn, that illiberal turn can be at least partially stopped. But I wouldn't, I would bet too much on it because this is not just these people, they are, represent, they are still representing something. 
And, and we've seen in the recent past, at least, uh, that discrediting these kind of personas doesn't necessarily work. If we just look at Putin or Trump, um, uh, the the calls for impeachment or the calls for for you know uh, uh, judicial action against these people have been many um, and and all across the world, and nothing has happened. So, is is this perhaps just uh, a um, a vulnerability that we imagine to be there and actually the political construct behind it is too powerful to uh, let that person be hurt? Yeah, but this is, I think, it's also, these, two, these are two different examples, Putin and Trump. And it also depends on the national political context, on the political system. With the very high support of Putin in Russia, I mean, there's no way that he can be even not re-elected in 2018. With Trump, it's still the question of the political setting in, in, in the country where the Republicans are you know, dominating uh, uh, the Senate. And uh, they would probably be considering really impeaching Trump if his, if his popular support dropped to 30%. Now that then they would be worried. But now they're not worried. So it, probably they, they're not going to impeach, me, to impeach him. So, so um, we, we spoke earlier about uh, two, two ideas of, of, of ways to counteract these movements or to counteract the mainstream, uh, to, to counteract the, the movement of these uh, ideas from fringe into mainstream. You talked first about uh, taming. Can we go into that? What, what, what are some examples of taming that have worked in the past? Yeah, uh, let me just give you um, a couple of examples. So in Italy, uh, there was a very um, long-standing party called Italian Social Movement. Uh, it was essentially called even a fascist movement. In Italy, there was no denazification, there was no uh, defascistization as it happened in Germany or even in Austria. So there was this legitimate fascist party, uh, Italian social movement. In the 90s, it was first renamed into National Alliance and it got rid of many radicals in, in the party because they wanted to participate in the political process. And in, in many European countries, in Western European countries, during the Cold War, um, essentially the, 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 these radical parties, they had to follow uh, two paths. They, they had to follow two paths. Those who still believed in the uh, potential of fascist revolution, they went to the fringes of the society. So they, even if they could run in the elections, they would have never been elected. And they understood that. That was really staying true to, to their own uh, beliefs. Parties, that re organizations that really wanted to take part in the electoral process, they had to, to you know, um, damper their, uh, their rhetoric. So this Italian party at first was renamed into National Alliance and the Alianza Nazionale and essentially uh, and, and eventually it, it de-radicalized even further and it became part of the uh, party of uh, Silvio Berlusconi. So it was just absorbed by Berlusconi. Berlusconi tamed them essentially. Also another example is um, is a progress party in Norway. And in Norway, in the 90s, that uh, progress party could be called a radical right-wing party. Um, it was never, in the 90s, it was never in the, in the government. But uh, mainstream parties, they started to somehow engage with this party on particular issues that were uh, either voted for in in, in the parliament or discussed in, uh, in the government. So there was sort of this soft supporters of the government. And it's also had a very taming effect on them. And they de-radicalized, they moderated, and now the consensus, I would say, that it's no longer a radical right-wing party, it's uh, even a liberal or center-right liberal party. So there, is, there are these examples. Um, another example is, uh, from Hungary, where you could refer to the, so the, you could say uh, about five years ago that the, 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 the major party, in, uh, far right party uh, in Hungary was Jobbik. Uh, during the last two, three years, Jobbik tried to moderate. Uh, they 
largely dropped their anti-Roma rhetoric. They dropped their anti-Semitic rhetoric. And some scholars who are based in Hungary and who were following the development of Jobbik would say that Fidesz, the ruling party of Viktor Orbán, is now more on the far right than Jobbik. And that, that this is something that I referred to during the discussion when you have the political space opened up. So Viktor Orbán went so far to the far right, to the you know to, to the right of the of the center right then Jobbik had the space open for them, and they could move to the center-right and at least um, try to conquer this space and now pose as a moderate, respectable party. So, yeah, taming may work in some situations where you could just um, try to engage somehow with these parties on political issues and give them sort of responsibility. And challenged by the, this responsibility, they may eventually become responsible. I wouldn't say that it's a 100% success case, but it, sometimes it does happen. And uh, when we talk about the, the difference between movements or... Uh uh, leadership that is defined by a party like traditionally Jobbik or the French National Front or even the Freedom Party here in Austria versus uh, persona-led movements like you said Orban or Trump or ones you were speaking about. What what's what are the different what's the difference between how how you can if a party moves further to the right another party can take its place if a person uh, is at the head of the movement is there a different approach that needs to be taken in order to uh, tame <laughs> tame these people, uh, or the or the or the populace, a different approach than uh, than on the on, in the political playing field in Parliament. Well, the, the, yeah, I, I'm, if we are talking about the European Union context here, mm -hmm. then it is a bit different. Although I would say that um, mm, stronger position of the European Union or Brussels on particularly liberal trends in Central Europe, but also in some other parts of, of the European Union, it is badly needed. I think that Brussels um, ignored, the, ignored the trends and the developments that were happening in Hungary and now happening in Poland. Although in Poland, uh, the, the Brussels was quicker than, in, uh, than in, uh, in the case of Hungary, but still, um, all these, because because Hungary under Orban and Poland under Kaczynski, they're moving too fast in the liberal direction. And the European Union being this very slow democratic machine, it just cannot catch up with all the developments. Uh, when Orban was essentially destroying the constitutional court, uh, when, when Orban cracked down on the media, the European Union acted and reacted very slowly. So with, with, these, with this new right or with these newest trends of, of the liberal politics, there should be an international action. And the, in the case of Europe, this is the action of the European Union that are badly needed. Uh, we, we spoke earlier also about a kind of a, a tactic or a, uh, a, a phenomenon you titled vaccination. Um, and you also mentioned this in, in uh, looking at our uh, local example of Norbert Hofer and uh, kind of change in position that, that can be, that can be uh, instrumental to changing the way politicians like this speak to the public. What, yeah. Can you explain I, that I a little would, bit? I wouldn't say that it's really a tactic, but it's what's happening uh, without any involvement of, of mainstream. Uh, well, of, it's not a deliberate act. So what I mean by vaccination is you, you, when you, if you look at 2016 and if you look at the Brexit referendum when the, uh, the Leave campaign won, uh, it was taken, this referendum, this Brexit was taken so negatively in the European countries and in the European societies that even the far right had to change their rhetoric. And if you remember that was uh, the Brexit uh, referendum took place before the second round, before the first second round of the presidential election in Austria, but after the first one, where Hofer, Norbert Hofer of the of the Austrian uh, Party of Freedom won, and then Austrians were were quite. I, I think there was this 
they were scared uh, uh, about Brexit. Well, probably nobody thought that it would happen, but then it, it does happen. And even Norbert Hofer had to say that, well, it would be a mistake for Austria to leave the European Union, but there are some conditions where we'd, we would consider leaving the European Union, but still, he really softened, softened the Eurosceptic rhetoric. So that was a vaccination. And another vaccination, a successful vaccination, was Donald Trump. So essentially, when you inject something really, really terrible, and uh, quite a liberal and quite disruptive for liberal democracy in the body politic of, of the European Union, then it, it kind of scares you and then the society does mobilize against the, the larger threat. So how did Trump vaccinate the European Union? Because of, because of, uh, because the European Union, I think the European societies in, in general, they have responded to the election of Donald Trump with, with a scare. That was, that was this part of the poison that uh, was somehow, um, part of the poison that somehow mobilized uh, the society. And I think without Trump and without Brexit, maybe uh, Austria would have President Hoffer in December 2016. Uh, I, do, I don't think that uh, Brexit and, and Trump really influenced the elections in, um, in France. I would still think that Le Pen would have lost anyway, but maybe her, her results would have been higher. But again, if we look at the Netherlands and the complete failure of the uh, Freedom Party of Geert Wilders there, I think partly the, this is the result of this vaccination by Brexit and Trump. So uh, also, I guess, fear on the, other, on the other side is also very powerful, uh, not just fear of foreigners or fear of other countries. Um, but when it comes to these kind of radical movements that often involve xenophobia, isolationism, have a lot to do with kind of, um, some say fear of globalization or the, or the entrails of globalization, what, what can happen because of it. Um, what, what needs to be done, in your opinion, to keep these kind of, uh, uh, movements marginal and, and at bay, kind of. Can, can liberal democracy steer away from these type of movements? Is there, is there, are there initiatives that can be done? Are there ways that political parties can mobilize besides the filling of the gaps that you mentioned? Well, this is something that I started from. I do blame, mo I don't blame the society for voting for, for these parties. I would still blame the these um, catch-all parties that became uh, de-ideologized. I would blame postmodernists that said that there are no, no truth in politics and th there are no master narratives, there are no grand narratives, and we can believe everything you want. I would say that the far right is strong not because it has better arguments, not it, uh, because it has better visions for the future, but because the mainstream parties became weak. Uh, they became weak, they, they cannot offer any grand visions anymore. Uh, they, again, they appeal to the, the, the whole of the society, but at the same time, they are, and there is this, I think that there is this uh, paradox. They do appeal to the whole of the society, not to particular groups, but at the same time, they started to be considered as elitist projects. And this populist rhetoric where the, where the populists, both on the right and then and on the left, would be talking about the, the, the elites that are no longer with the society. Uh, they are now gaining ground because, partly because of, this, of the rhetoric they employ. Uh, but uh, strangely, it also works with the, with the governments. And let me again uh, uh, go to the, the example of Hungary. So Jobbik was, a, at least, probably still is a populist party, a right-wing pop populist party. But Orban is also populist. Uh, but he cannot employ the same rhetoric. So he cannot say that there are, there are elites in, in the country which are ruining the, this country, because uh, that would be the rhetoric of, 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 of Jobbik, which is on the opposition. So these are ruling elites and they are ruin, uh, ruining the country and we represent the common people. So we are the common people against these um, 
uh, corrupt elites, which would be represented by Orban. But Orban is also populist, but he cannot use this rhetoric because he is the elite. So what Trump. he does is he transnationalizes populist rhetoric. He will say Hungary is a common people and Brussels is the corrupt elite. So you play, you play with this rhetoric as, as, as you want, but still you have to divide, uh, you have to divide the society uh, if you're using this uh, populist rhetoric. So it's always an us and them rhetoric of, it is of all, a all blame this. society. Yeah, and again, this is the, the paradox because in the end, they want, and because the casual part is they want to appeal to the whole of the society, but in the end, they are represented as something who are polarizing the society. So how can, if, if we're talking about these catch-all parties, um, and you say that having, having a strong vision, a strong message, um, or, or a story that's, that's easily uh, reproducible or tellable that everyone can relate to um, is much more um, mobilizing than being a catch-all party, trying to please everyone at once. Uh, is there an example of a party that has, has made that transition from being a catch-all party to re-attracting a, 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 a base of voters? Mm. I think probably Labour, a Labour party in the UK, would be a good example um, under, Corbyn, uh, under Corbyn. Mm -hmm. They're trying to somehow um, go back to the roots, uh, go back to the, it's even, you know, far left roots uh, with, with Corbyn. But I would say that still the, the, um, the examples are too few. Uh, to mention. So mostly of these are still catch-all parties and people are getting tired of them. Look what happened to, to the Austrian political party political space where this ground coalition, the red and, and, and black, is no longer satisfying for the people. But people probably, they don't, they don't, they no longer interested in this coalition. They want something new. Probably they don't know what, what exactly they want, but they want something new. And this is why I think um, um, this is partly the reason why uh, new lists and new movements are, uh, are getting more popular support now. Um, and just, just to touch on this before we go and open up to the audience for questions, I just wanted to ask a little bit about your, your book, <laughs> because Russia, um, I mean, perhaps next to North Korea is probably the, the hottest uh, topic in the news right now when it comes to uh, mysterious governmental uh, doings and handlings. Um, Russia and the Western far right. So uh, give us a little bit of, of, of a teaser. What, what can we expect from this book? I was, I was trying to explore and investigate the relations between uh, contemporary Russia and various uh, far-right movements and parties and their ideologues in the West. And by the West, I mean Canada, US, and, but mostly the European Union or Europe in general. Um, but I was also looking at the history of the relations. Um, very few people know that the Soviet Union being a, well, officially anti-fascist uh, country uh, still had relations with the, uh, with the far right in Western countries, especially NATO countries, to undermine them somehow because they, they understood that the far right are disruptive for liberal democracies and they used them to influence politics there. And there you have this continuity to what is happening today. Russia, uh, Russia is always considering uh, two, I would say, plans, plan A and plan B. Plan A would still be working with the mainstream politicians, especially though with those who are in power, or if they're close to power, they would like to cooperate them, with them. But the problem with, with, for Russia is that um, with its anti-Western, anti-American trends that started in 2004, 2005, they have less and less allies in the West. So the plan B is to cooperate with the far right. It's like a good cop, bad cop. So good cop plan is to work with the mainstream and try to corrupt them. And plan B, so, okay, if you're not going to work with us, we are going to disrupt you and somehow undermine uh, liberal consensus in, 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 in the West and transatlantic relations, because Russia would essentially be interested in having bilateral relations. Because I think, well, with the very few exceptions, Russia would be stronger than 
than individual members of the EU rather than the EU in general. So um, undermining the unity of the West is is essential for Putin's Russia at the moment. So I was I was looking at these trends. I tried to. Um, establish uh, particular patterns, how it's all happening. I try to establish what I call coordinators, people who help build these relations and to analyze how far they can go and for how, how they developed. Because the, there is, of course, this is a hot topic uh, today, but it was happening for many, many years. In the 90s, there were fringe contacts between Russian ultranationalists and their counterparts in the West. But since 2004, 2005, more significant and more mainstream actors on the Russian side uh, started to be engaged in this game. So are there um, any current examples? I mean, I don't want you to give away all the secrets of the book, but are there any uh, current examples of uh, countries in the EU that are up against this kind of... Uh, uh, Infiltration by by uh, by Russian Plan A or Plan B wise uh, to 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 kind of um, unsteady the the political climate there. Yeah. So the book is about Plan B. I uh, didn't okay. touch on Plan A yet, uh, but uh, there are several countries where you would have very quite strong uh, pro-Putin sentiments on the part of the far right. And I would say that this is France, this is Austria, this is still Hungary, this is Bulgaria, uh, this is Italy. So th in, in these countries you have very strong pro-Russian sentiments, or pro-Kremlin, -pro pro-Putin sentiments. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we are talking about infiltration all the time. It's not that Russia is infiltrating these movements. Uh, when I was looking at of the development of these relations, I very often found that it was the initiative of particular far-right movements in the West that wanted to work with, with, uh, with the Kremlin, rather than Kremlin you know, proposing to these far-right to work with them. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't take away the agency of the far-right parties and movements themselves, because sometimes it, it, it is quite strong. Uh, let, me, let me give you the Austrian example, if we are in Austria. Uh, the FPÖ, the Freedom Party, made its uh, pro-Kremlin turn already in 2008, at least. Uh, but the contacts that they had with the representatives of, of, I wouldn't say even Russian elites, but from various Russian actors, was quite low. They might have reached the, the medium level of these contacts, uh, but not at, until last year when they managed to establish really high contacts. If you, if you know, uh, the Freedom Party of Austria signed a coordination and cooperation agreement with the ruling party in Russia, uh, the, the United Russia, and this is, quite, this is a very high contact. Uh, but that could, also ha that could also happen, could only happen, because the Kremlin thought that the mainstream parties were in decline in Austria. And this idea was given, uh, they thought that was, that was what was happening because of the loss of the conservative and social democrat candidates in the presidential elections. So f for them that was a signal, okay, something is happening in Austria. And so the, our, our partners, probably they are in decline. Of course, they don't have huge expertise uh, on Austrian politics in the Kremlin. They could not really understand that uh, probably the, uh, the Social Democratic Party and the People's Party not, had not very good or you know, uh, not very good candidates for the presidential election. That was part of the reason why Hoffa uh, finished first in the first round. But still, I thought, okay, so something is happening. So what do we have there? Oh, we have this medium-level context with the with the Freedom Party of Austria. So let's let's try it. Let's let's work with them. Uh, but the the Kremlin always looks at national context before they start cooperating with the far right. For example, they, they, are, they are not cooperating with the Jobbik party in Hungary because they have Fidesz. Why would they support the, the opposition force to Fidesz if with Orban they work so well? So it's, it's like you know, plan A, plan B, they can interchange. So.
It sounds like a fascinating book. Um, I'm about to open up for uh, everyone f to ask questions, and I'm sure that Anton will also be hanging around a little bit afterwards, so if your question doesn't get, uh, if you don't get a chance for your voice to be heard, feel free to approach him afterwards. Um, I, however, do have to go, so I'm gonna hand over my microphone uh, real quick. And, uh, but the floor is open. Who would like to ask the first question? I saw a hand in the back. Onvar. Well, um, but before I leave, I'd like to say one thing, uh, which is thank you, first of all, to Anton Shekhozov for his insights. And this topic is increasingly relevant in today's political climate. Grab his book, Russia and the West Western Far Right. It can be gotten on Amazon and anywhere else books are sold. Um, and my name is Margaret Childs. You guys were wonderful. Thanks so much. I will see you around. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> Thank you indeed. So I'm not Margaret anymore. I'm Mati, and uh, thank you. Well, that thank was you. fascinating, Margaret. Thank you. I was sitting there, and I, was, I mean, well, sure, sure. I mean, it's it, these are all scary topics. Although listening to you, it doesn't sound. I'm not as despondent as I sometimes am. Uh, maybe there's a twinkle in your eye about the whole thing. There's a kind of comedy of it all. Um, maybe that's dangerous too. Well, maybe I'm, it's late in the day. Who would like to ask a question? I already have the microphone, so just a quick question, and then I'll hand it to the next one. Um, you pointed to the fact that populists need this division between us and them. We the people against you the elite. We Hungarians against Brussels. But I was thinking, um, Going back to any revolution, actually, take the uh, Soviet revolution. You have we, the working class, against you, the capitalists. Isn't this a key feature, actually, of any democracy also? You don't need to go to revolutions, that there is a division between you, uh, between us and you, between and them. So isn't this division everywhere? What is so special about the populists? It's not special about populists. Uh, it's special about right-wing populists, the radical right-wing populists. And of course, you, when you when you have this proletariat fighting against the capitalist class, that was a populist. Uh, in this end, that was a populist part of the Russian Revolution. Of course, you you, you use this uh, uh, you use this rhetoric all the time. And when you because politics is at least fighting for for power, that's always polarizing the society. You have to polarize the society somehow to say that we represent the real workers or the real peasants or the real middle class against those who want to somehow undermine us. Yeah, you, you have this. But with populism or with radical right-wing populism today, it's also very undemocratic. It is, it is undermining the, the, the liberal consensus. It's also very authoritarian as such because they don't leave a space. Because Russian Revolution made by the Bolsheviks, Bolshevik, Bolsheviks were authoritarians. They did not leave the space for the capitalist class in their society. They said that the, our society would be classless. So this is this authoritarian approach. This is what I think is, um, is an essential feature of these radical right-wing populists and left-wing populists. But there is, another, there is another way to be populist. Uh, if, you, if you look at Macron, he was, he was, his rhetoric was quite anti-establishment as well. But he used this anti-establishment and partly populist rhetoric uh, in order to strengthen the, the pro-EU sentiments in the French society. And he won on the pro-EU uh, pro agenda, in my opinion. We have a question back there. Could you comment on the active downloading of uh, anti-communist memory in Central and Eastern Europe and uh, whether the EU's institutionalization of the anti-totalitarian day on the 21st of August contributed to uh, the no longer silent counter-revolution? I haven't heard of Downloading this uh, what anti-communist memory uh, is, is it a book? I mean, I haven't heard of it. Can I, you can you explain? Uh, I have not heard of this either. Well, the twenty-third of August uh, was established as uh, 
the date of commemoration for all victims of totalitarianism in Europe in 2009 by an EU directive. And uh, looking at the two main cases which you and other commentators have uh, mentioned, the case of uh, Poland and uh, of uh, Hungary, uh, these parties based uh, on uh, an authoritarian trend uh, to a certain extent, some have argued, go back to their anti-communist past. Mm. Now, with uh, the EU institutionalizing no. this memory, to what extent do you see this in the discourse? I think we got it now. Yeah, I think that most of the people actually don't know that, that this uh, date was established. So I would celebrate this date to the 23rd uh, of August, but most of the people don't know about this. And I don't think that Hungary under Orban really needs uh, this date or celebration established by the European Union uh, to, to uh, implement his policies. This is something that I think quite marginal. And only historians and only people who follow contemporary politics would know that the European Union now has established this date of commemoration. So I don't think it does contribute to the uh, silent counter-revolution. I see a hand there and one back there. Um, do you think that Putin is the main thing that is standing between a reconciliation between the broader European Union and Russia? Or is there something that is kind of an undercurrent in Russian politics that is causing this rift? And is it, is it a kind of holdover from the Cold War era? Yeah, this is a very good question. There is a, this huge debate whether Putinism would be able to survive Putin himself. So after Putin, maybe you know, Putinism will, will, will continue. I would say that it, depend, it really depends on who comes to power after Putin. If it's still his own circle or people who were raised to be uh, as authoritarian as he is, then Putinism will, will continue. But at the same time, so I would say that the question, I would reinterpret this question in, in the following way. Is the cultural change in Russia under Putin has, has now been so great that there is no way that Russia can modernize and democratize? I think that partly this is true. Uh, there has been a cultural change, a very deep cultural change. So it would probably take dozens of years to, to change the society back at least to the sense of freedom and celebration of freedom that they had during the 90s. Although those were very hard uh, times for the entire post-Soviet space. Uh, so freedom was followed by impoverishment of, of the societies of the post-Soviet space, but still these this thrust towards democratization was so strong. It has, it, I think it has now been lost. It, it may, uh, maybe now it is being accepted or, or the westernization and modernization is being accepted by, um, by a minuscule uh, percentage of, of Russian people. But also, there is also the, the good hope uh, here is that uh, if the regime does change and if uh, the independent media uh, become real fifth force or fifth power in, in, in Russia, then the society can change faster and it can recreate itself. This, this is my opinion. Thank you. There's a question back there. Dmitry Khutki from EOM. Um, I'm just wondering, if I get you right, then you link these uh, phenomena in a kind of global trend. Um, and I'm wondering, is this kind of uh, a phenomenon in itself, like just the changes in ideology which happen like in parallel, or are they linked uh, to a broader uh, political agenda? Um, and, and if yes, then where is all this going? For example, would you say that this rise of far right uh, movements are kind of uh, signs of wider uh, political institutional mobilization for like mercantilism, pro protectionism, nationalism, and maybe even leading to hostilities and local, and maybe wider conflicts. Like, is this kind of trend which just uh, in the minds of people, or it's already going transfer into a political realm? Thank you. I would say that this is um, mostly the phenomenon of, of the Western world. 
um, we can we can interpret the radicalization of Islam in Middle East also as part of this radicalization global radicalization process. But I still I would still believe that. Uh, what is happening today in the European Union and the West as general is a very Western phenomenon as such. And it is, it is different from what is going on in other parts of the world. Um, I think that it has, in, 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 in the European context and the, or in the Western context in general, it has to do with the changes or transformation, transformation of the party political system and also cultural changes that, were hap that have been happening especially uh, since the 1960s. So we cannot really relate these developments to the other parts of the world because they did not have experienced them. I see a hand back there. So you, you were mainly laying the blame for this on the catch-all parties losing their bases to a certain extent and, and no longer claiming to represent one particular constituency but instead the public good and then leaving room for others who were going to represent specific us against uh, them. Um, but could you say a little more about what are the structures that led to that and whether those structures that led to that might be reversed or are still in place? or So why, if this has been leading to these slow death of the parties, um, why, might it, uh, why is there a chance for it to be reversed or is there no chance for it to be reversed? I think it was, I think it was a strategy of some of the uh, mainstream parties and the strategies that they um, try and try, try to re realize or implement from, from the, the beginning of the Cold War, so essentially the 1950s, 19, 1960s, they, uh, it was a tactic just to mobilize as many people in a given society as possible. So they started to appeal to the whole society. It was, it was a sort of electoral trick that worked for, for, many, uh, for some of the parties. For example, it could work for social democrats or it could, uh, it could work for conservatives and that the other part would uh, take, the same, take the same approach or you know, employ the same, the, the same approach to, to electoral politics or electoral campaigning. I don't think it, it can be, we, we discussed this earlier, I don't, I don't see any good examples of where parties could be re-ideologized. But I think that it should, it, it should be happening in a way. Uh, you, parties did, you did do, mention labor, which I think is a good example. Yes, labor, maybe some other, I just can't think of them uh, right now, where you have this ideology or you have a vision start to appear. I'm not that actually pessimistic about, uh, about the European Union and polit party politics in general because now I see that I could complain a few years ago that, that public intellectuals are, are keeping away from politics and they don't offer any visions, they don't discuss really pressing issues like identity or European identities. But now I think that things are changing. I'm not complaining anymore. I see books that are being published that discuss these pressing issues and I think a new sort of consensus is in the making. A new sort of ideology um, may, come back, may come back to the European Union. Sounds great. Uh, one more question. Yeah, that would be great. I have one question that I will ask later. Well, last, but because if, um, if I'm sitting here, I have a. Yeah, I have thank to you. Ask. Um, you mentioned about the vaccination of the Europe uh, after emergence of the Brexit and Donald Trump in America, vaccination of Europe against the uh, right wing extremism and uh, right wing actual populism. But how much is it really true? Because what's like at the moment Austria is facing is actually the rise of a new sort of like populism by Sebastian Kurz and uh, the reality of uh, what's being heard uh, and what's being talked in the, in the political scene of the Austria shows that actually populism is rising uh, somehow refurnished and in a new ways and the danger actually exists. I know that that was not the case in France but also it can be the case in Germany by the, in the, the coming election and some more uh, Euro, uh, North European countries. But do you, how, how much do you think really 
uh, Europe is vaccinated against the uh, right-wing populism. Um, okay, let's 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 talk Aust Austria. And if you remember, there was al already a government uh, of the People's Party and the Freedom Party uh, 17 years ago, and they failed. After after the the, the government fell, the the support for the for the Freedom Party of Austria was so low. Yeah, it, it, it collapsed. It, it, they had to change leadership, they had to change approaches, and only then they could recover. But it took them years to recover. So I think that that, that particular government was a sort of vaccination against the far right. It doesn't work. It's like, you know, with the influenza, with flu. You have to change the vaccine all the time. You have to find new approaches to how you don't get ill. So that was a vaccination that worked for several years. Uh, now, I don't know what it will, what's going to happen now, but um, there, is, there is another interpretation of vaccination, which is accepting that some of the policy proposal of the far right are legitimate. And I think that uh, many, 10 years or five years ago, uh, the European Union and, and even public intellectuals would not be speaking about securing and strengthening external borders of the EU. Not, now it's, it's a sort of a new consensus. And, but the, that, that particular narrative, it, it did originate from the uh, far right or at least you know, these uh, national conservative movements. It, is now, it has now become mainstream. And borders, external borders, borders of the EU will be strengthened. So some of the policies that, that of the far right they, that may have huge political or popular support, they will be probably accepted by the mainstream. And this is also will weaken the, the rhetoric of, of the far right. What is happening in Austria, again, you can see that Sebastian Kurz did adopt some of the narratives that uh, were uh, pronounced or articulated by the FP, by, by the Freedom Party. And if, if you remember, I think it was still 10, 10 months ago, uh, the Freedom Party of Austria was on, on the top yeah. in the public opinion Last polls. Time. And now it's, it's Sebastian Kurz who, I think, quite elaborately re-articulated some of the narratives of the FPÖ and that contributed to his current success. I have to ask you briefly, since I'm sitting here now, and uh, as an American, the, the greatest obsession politically right now with Donald Trump, well, there are lots of them, but um, is the Russian issue, the, 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 the question of whether or not Putin directly, Russia, influenced the election. And since I'm sitting next to such a Russia expert, I mean, it would follow from what you said before, plan A, plan B, that it was not, well, those of us on the on the progressive side would love for there to be some sort of smoking gun where it can be proven that there was collusion between Trump and Putin. It would follow from what you're saying that that's probably not the case. What is, what is your sense? I'm always quite cautious about uh, on the topic of, of Russian interference in the US elections. First, we are still, I, I still, I think, need the smoking gun. Mm -hmm. um, I am convinced that Russia did interfere, but this is my belief, or this is my hypothesis, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I need more data uh, to, to, to prove that it were, this is what happened. It, I think that, the, the, you see, with the, for example, when Putin said, says, so these hackers, they're like uh, free artists. Yeah. They wake up in the morning, read the news, and think that, that the US is somehow doing some injustice to Russia. And so these Russian patriotic hackers uh, do that themselves. So basically he's talking about the, the freelance actors. And I do believe that there are many freelance actors. Uh, when I was writing the book, uh, it, was, it was very, at some point it started to be very obvious for me that maybe at least 70% of all these relations uh, are being managed from the Russian side by these freelancers. Okay. Because Putin's system is a system where different groups, different points of power, uh, they compete with each other. And Putin is a sort of this arbiter 
who, who manages the conflicts between different groups of interest, who, who again competing each other. So I would believe that uh, the interference was probably not um, originated uh, from, from Putin himself or his inner circle, by from one of these groups that are close to the Kremlin, but that wants to raise their status in this Putin system, and they did that. So I think it was sort of, still within the elites that was a uh, bot, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, bottom up approach. Wow. Let me close for here, but, but say two things. Um, there is another event that, has, uh, that involves the, the immediate Russian orbit and Ukraine in particular um, in half an hour on uh, Maidan um, upstairs, Marcy Shore. But also in half an hour here, we're going to continue to talk about digitization and the various ills and dangers with Max Schrems. So I urge you all to stick around and I urge you to say thank you to Anton. That was so fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank I you. I really appreciate it.